Well, it's become a bit de rigueur to ask the question, how many of you uh, speak Vietnamese? And how many of you have been to Vietnam? That gives the ambassador a sense of, of, of who you are. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the ambassador was appointed as the fifth ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to the United States in July of 2014. He's also been accredited as senior ambassador, the highest rank for a Viet, uh, Vietnamese career diplomat. Uh, prior to that, from 2011 to 2014, the ambassador served as deputy minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in charge of relations with countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the South Pacific, and Vietnam's senior official to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. From September 2008 to September 2011, the ambassador held the position of Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs and Vietnam's ASEAN uh, senior official. From January 2007 to September 2008, he was the de Deputy Director General and then Director General at Vietnam's ASEAN. Uh, much of his earlier service uh, or earlier career was spent uh, in the Foreign Service. He was attached to the Department of International Organizations, where he began as a desk officer and was later promoted to Assistant Director General and then Deputy Director General, a position that he held until December 2003. He was posted twice to the permanent mission of Vietnam at the United Nations, first as an attache, then as a minister counselor and deputy permanent representative. His third posting was to the Embassy of Vietnam in Bangkok as a minister counselor. The ambassador graduated from the University of Foreign Affairs in Hanoi, Vietnam. He earned a postgraduate degree at Canberra College of Advanced Education in Australia. He is visiting here with his wife, who we welcome as well. They are the parents of two children. Thank you. Um, today's presentation, as I mentioned, is titled Vietnam-U.S. Relations, Two Decades of Robust Growth and the Way Forward. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Pham Quang Vinh. Thank you very much, Then, With a full house as this, I feel very much honored. And I just talk uh, before this meeting that uh, if you have too much and too high expectations, I'm not up to the marks. <laughs> but I come here as a friend and as a colleague to share with you ideas on how I view and Vietnam views Vietnam-U.S. relations. This year is very much important for us that we celebrate the 20th anniversary of our diplomatic relations. But I want to start to say that when I look around and when you were asked to raise your hand whether you can speak Vietnamese or whether you have visited Vietnam, I think that's already a reflection of how robust uh, development that we can have. Can we have the first slide, please? So my honor again uh, to be here, uh, just to share, there's a rent. In, in the Vietnamese language, the word lecture is very high from the teacher to students, but here is just talking among colleagues and friends that we can share. And I would like to present to you uh, three parts of my, they may, may have five parts here, but three parts of my presentation to you. Number one, an overview of Vietnam-US relations, and number two, I just present to you a picture of New Vietnam with dynamic development. And number three, we have also a dynamic uh, it's by President Ho Chi Minh. He went over to the US for uh, studying the ways moving the countries forward. And the countries was then under the colonial domination of the French. He went over to the US. He stayed some time in Boston, the version of your own, also of your own revolution against the uh, British colonial rule. So it's, we have a history and back uh, in 1946, so one year after the establishment of the Republic, President Ho Chi Minh wrote to your pre uh, president then uh, Truman, Harry Truman, a number of letters conveying the message from the new Vietnam that we want uh, comprehensive 
uh, relationship with the U.S. here. But at that point in time, uh, we cannot make it, and uh, uh, it was not the way uh, that we wanted later on. And so when we look back how two decades of diplomatic relations uh, we can achieve together, I want to mention that one. And I also want to mention the last 60 years seems to be a history of Vietnam-U.S. relations as well. And it relates something that I call uh, the cycles of 20 years, from 1955 to 1975, we have a war. And from 1975 to 1995, we have the embargo after the war. And now, in 1995 is a critical moment in time that we have a normalization and diplomatic relations. And between 95 and uh, 2015, that's great achievements that we work together. So we we'll see in the slide that politically from normalization to comprehensive partnership, that is not just a span of time, but a long process that has been uh, achieved by hardworking from both the statement and the people, ordinary people from both our nations. So we have moving from foes to friends and to comprehensive partnership. Comprehensive partnership has been established since 2013 when my president, Chung Tan Sang, visited the US and uh, adopted that comprehensive partnership with President Obama. Throughout our two decades of diplomatic relations, I think political has been very much good uh, part of our uh, relationship. Economic is always a pillar, and you can see through the span of two decades, uh, trade relations between Vietnam and the U.S. has been uh, increasing uh, very much. If two decades ago we have about half a half a million uh, trade uh, in U.S. dollars, and now we have, and this year we have 40 billion U.S. dollars, so 84 increase in trade relations between Vietnam and the U.S. And for investment, U.S. now is ranking number seven investor, foreign investor in Vietnam with a total value of 11 billion U.S. dollars. But I think in this case, we can have more uh, US investment to Vietnam. And people to people exchange has been very much important part of our two case relationship. Number one, uh, we have the figures now about half a million uh, American visitors to Vietnam every year, Why we have about 50,000 Vietnamese uh, visitors to the US every year. And for the students, we have sent uh, some 17,000 Vietnamese students studying now in uh, the US colleges and universities. And this is Vietnam. With this figure, Vietnam ranks number one among the ASEAN countries, Southeast Asian countries in the US, and also number eight uh, countries throughout the world that have the high number as this in the US. So this is very much important for us to, to go around. And throughout uh, the years, we have a lot of uh, political high level visits uh, to the countries. Can you have a slide show of the number of visits? Uh, President Clinton in 2000, President uh, Bush in 2006, and President Chiang Tung Sang of Vietnam went to the US in 2013, and the two presidents adopted the Comprehensive Partnership Statement, highlighting the nine pillars, nine big areas of our cooperation from political to foreign affairs, to security, to defense, and trade education, and including also human rights, and regional cooperation. So this is what we have. We have strong ties uh, 
uh, with the U.S. Congress. A lot of visitors from Vietnam, high-ranking officials from Vietnam, not only for government-to-government -government relations, but also they went over to the Hill. And throughout the course of our relations, the Congress has been a very important part in promoting uh, before the normalization and now the promotion of our comprehensive partnership. And this is the visit in July by uh, our party uh, secretary general to the US. And this is the second part that I want to mention. 2015 to me is a milestone year. It's not just because the year 2015 is a mark of celebrating the 20th anniversary of our di diplomatic relations, but really it's a milestone and foundation, strong foundation for the way forward in our uh, cooperation and relations. And I can consider uh, this one, uh, the visit by the party uh, leaders to, uh, to the US. This is the first one, and both the Vietnamese and the Americans are calling this one as a historic uh, visit. Why it is historic? This is the first time, certainly. But this, the, the one thing is that the two leaders, President Obama and uh, my party leader, they adopted an issue, what they call the joint vision statement. It's not only reaffirming the basic uh, foundations of our relations and the, stretch, uh, the comprehensive partnership, but at the same time, it highlights the, the way forward, the future relationship of our two countries. And among the principles that guide our relations has one which is very much important, I think, in our relationship. That is uh, to respect the political system of our two countries and have cooperation on the basis of mutual benefit and understanding. Because uh, Vietnam and the US, we have uh, different political and social system. So this one is the thing and the foundation for further strengthening and deepening our mutual trust and cooperation. So I think this is very much important. Also in 2015, we have the visit of the new Secretary of Defense, Ashton Carter, to Vietnam. And there, uh, back in June this year, they adopted also the joint vision statement on uh, defense relations so they will have bilateral relations in defense, and at the same time, they have uh, regional cooperation. For example, the ASEAN Defense Ministers meeting uh, plus, and also at the UN peacekeeping. And my president went to the peacekeeping summit in uh, September in New York, called by President Obama, and they had a good summit over there. And I want to mention that, uh, 2015 is also the year that we cooperate a lot, uh, both on trade and on, uh, on defense and security issue. The US and Vietnam has strong relationship uh, with regard to ASEAN and to the region since US rebalancing. And at the same time, on the economic side of it, it was very much a milestone and a landmark for the conclusion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the TPP, in Atlanta earlier in October uh, this year. And Vietnam and the US was part of this process, and I think that will give us uh, further potentials for cooperation for the mutual benefits. And to us, the TPP, like in, to the US as well, it serves our, both, both our nation's interests, including not only for the expansion of trade, but at the same time for the expansion of job and social welfare as well. And maybe this will be an area later on that we can have Q&A and further discussions. So over the past 20 years, a lot of US businesses and, and companies have come to Vietnam. And we have uh, uh, them both in uh, in different parts of the country, and I think we have one colleague, entrepreneur, Ben uh, Friedman. You've been 
working with Vietnam as well with trade relations. And we have, uh, for example, during the visit of my party leader and my president to Washington DC and to New York, we very much often organize what we call uh, the business forum. And the party leader had talks with a forum of about uh, 250 entrepreneurs from the American side. And they are talking about the possibility and potential of enhancing further our investment and trade relations, including uh, uh, in the context of the coming TPP at that point in time. And I think a lot of your companies have plans for expanding further cooperation with Vietnam in the prospect of, of the TPP. And this is the nuclear summit in 2010. I think we will have the last round of the nuclear summit in 2016 in March next year. And so we will have a, another high level visit to Washington DC next year. And it will be my job to stay there to receive them. So la last year in October 2000, can you come back to this slide? Last year in October 2014, Vietnam and the US announced the adoption of the 1230 nuclear agreement. This opened together open opportunities for our cooperation as well. And we have Westinghouse coming to the south of Vietnam for, uh, uh, for a project of uh, 90 million US dollars on, on wind farm, wind turbine uh, power. And this is very good. And at the same time last year, uh, we have the partial lifting of the arms embargo. And all these two uh, agreements have uh, this year an impact for greater trade relations between our two countries. So continue. Now, uh, for my posting as ambassador, I think that promoting people-to-people -people relations will be very much important. Student exchange and teacher ex uh, exchange will be very much important part in it. But at the same time, from state to state and provinces, relationship will be very much important. We have been establishing a number of uh, sister uh, city relationship between some state and cities over here and with uh, provinces and uh, cities in Vietnam. And they have been doing good uh, uh, people to people relations and at the same time trade relations. So we have a number of here and I have been to California and now Utah and I will continue to be going to the different state here uh, during my tenure as ambassador here to promote further education and people to people exchange. So here in the Utah we have good relationship and the BYU, you have a good relationship with Vietnam as well. And I think earlier this year, earlier next, last month, uh, the uh, Deputy Minister of Home Affairs and head of the Government Committee for Research Affairs, Deputy Minister Pham Zong has been here. He says a dual head as such, but uh, we have an interim board of the uh, Latter day Saint Church in, in Vietnam, and we continue to work to have a formal recognition of the church in Vietnam. And his part of his visit is for that, and I think uh, relationship, people to people, exchange, education, and the church representation in Vietnam will be good for both uh, our two countries' relationship and for Utah's relationship with Vietnam. And you can recognize and uh, uh, Jeffrey Holland has visited Vietnam also uh, in August uh, 2015 this year. So we see the picture of his visit to Vietnam. He was received by the Vice President of the National Assembly, the Parliament of Vietnam. And so any the uh, congressman from this uh, state of Utah has been visiting Vietnam this was back in 2012, and my prime minister was receiving him. And you have uh, Jason Chavez. He is also following the Mormon church. 
the, uh, this church, and uh, he has been very kind to me, receiving me on the first days of my uh, tenure as ambassador in Washington, D.C. So for trade relations, we have a great potential, and I know you have a very good record for uh, uh, giving facilitations to investment and trade uh, by the state of Utah. Vietnam export to Utah is now worth of say 24 million US dollars and 28% increase from last year. But we also have business present, your business uh, presence in Vietnam as well. For example, Dow is Taipan and Sidekicks. And this will be a, a good foundation for us to expand further. And during this visit, I will have a, a, a luncheon with the business circle over here. And I will have a, an honor to visit the governor here. And I will speak about the relationship, political and trade relations, and people to people exchange with the state of Utah. Now, I present to you Vietnam. Uh, I think Vietnam is new now, and many of you have been back and forth to Vietnam. I think you can recognize a really new Vietnam if you compare it at the time of our uh, normalization uh, 20 years ago. So the new Vietnam I want to mention to you here is that it's a nation that has a long history and uh, a diversified culture. But at the same time, uh, Vietnam is very much now dynamic in its economic development and growth. And this year, the growth rate of the economy of Vietnam is projected at 6.5%. I think it will be uh, uh, one of the few that have uh, positive economic growth rate for this year, while China and other countries uh, are a little bit slowing down in, in that region. And at the same time, Vietnam has, is very much uh, uh, determined to revitalize and restructuring its macroeconomic uh, uh, structure, including in the area of uh, financial and banking institutions. Uh, we are focusing so so on investment in infrastructure and human resources development. And I think all these areas will help us to ensure the macroeconomic stability in the region and further growth. But at the same time, I want to mention on the external economic relations, we have now been discussing and have agreed uh, about 15 FTAs, foreign uh, uh, FTA free trade agreements with a number of countries and, and economic uh, regions of the world. And very important that we have agreed in principle an FTA with the European Union. And I think uh, we will soon have a sign, have been able to sign that one as well. And we have the TPP. And at the same time, we have uh, the ASEAN economic community coming into being uh, in December 2015. All this one will help us both to expand our uh, trade relations with foreign partners but at the same time, in helping to build further an enabling uh, environment in Vietnam for trade and businesses from foreign countries. And for the population, I think our population is young because over 50% of the people in Vietnam are now under the median age is under uh, 30 years of age uh, out of the total population of 91 or 92 million people. And the young people are very much active and dynamic now. 40% of the population have access to the internet, while 141% of the population, that means 128, 141% uh, have uh, mobile phones. So uh, out of the total of 90 million people, many of them have two mobile phone accounts. And the social media is also a uh, 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 expanding phenomenon in Vietnam now. 34 million people are using uh, social media, so it's about uh, 40 or 44% or something. So this is something 
uh, some figure to reflect to you how a new Vietnam is. And finally, I want to look a little bit into the new context of the Asia and the Pacific. As you know, already Asia is a hotspot now uh, because of its uh, uh, attractiveness in, 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 in both the culture and, and uh, economic uh, opportunities. I think uh, many people a long time ago called it the Asian Center, but I I'm more inclined to the idea that the geopolitical, strategic, and economic uh, gravity from the world has been shifting steadily from, uh, from the west to the east, and Asia is now in the region of very much dynamic uh, development. And the con countries in the region are surviving the 1997 and 1998 crisis, economic crisis that are now uh, developed in a more steady and stable manner. And we have uh, the phenomenal rise of China and India, and we view this rise as an opportunity for us to, uh, in the region to further growth and, and develop ourselves. But at the same time, we are facing the challenges of how to accommodate both China and, and India in the evolving regional architecture in the region as well. <coughs> and the U.S. rebalancing is at the right time five or six years ago when it uh, decided to have a greater engagement with the region in both security terms and economic terms as well. And the TPP is very much important in that context. It set our a framework of high standards and also uh, uh, in sh uh, very much in emphasizing on the rule of law and certain set of rules that countries think that will be a new generation of free trade agreement. And Vietnam and the U.S. Is part, are part of this one. And I think if the TPP is successful, that will create a model for trade relationship and trade, uh, uh, free trade agreements for the world as well. Why I said if successful, number one, between now and then, we need to uh, have countries in the TPP to ratify, and it will be a big fight here in the US as well. It will be a big discussion back home in Vietnam as well. But I very much hope that despite all the differences that we may have from different ang angles looking into the TPP, uh, finally, we can achieve the ratification of TPP by all the parties to it, including by the U.S. and by Vietnam as well. And I think today, the text of the TPP has been released by the by Ambassador Mike Foreman, the trade representative from the U.S., and it's good. It will be a 90-day uh, period of reviewing and discussing and commenting and fighting. But my hope is that Whatever we do, the final uh, ratification uh, will be at hand by the Congress in Washington, D.C. And that will be good for the region, good for the U.S., and good for Vietnam as well. And I want to mention a little bit more about the evolving regional architecture in, in Asia. Uh, Asia is different from other regions of the world that for example, in Europe, we have some form of institutional organizations for, for the region working together, like the European Union. But Asia is so diverse, and uh, we do not have an umbrella, an umbrella regional architecture that includes all of us, that includes all areas of cooperation and challenges that we face. So every part of the processes in the region can be a binding block for the new evolving regional architecture. And people think that ASEAN framework can be a good way to start, to start with, so that ASEAN is in. And the U.S. joined, joined the ASEAN frameworks in 2011 uh, by, uh, by participating in the East Asia Summit in that context. 
And I think that we 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 very much hope that uh, we can bring together an architecture that include both the U.S. and China, the biggest, the two biggest uh, major power in the world now, so that they can cooperate and con can compete within a context of an environment that serves the interests not only of the two superpowers or the two major powers, but at the same time the interests of other smaller countries and the whole region as well. And uh, an environment of rule of law, an environment of uh, frank and and <coughs> and uh, trust-based dialogue will continue to be a framework for us to go together. Why we have a lot to work together for cooperation, cooperation on economic political relationship, cooperation on meeting the challenges like uh, climate change or maritime security. But at the same time, we have some hotspot like the South China Sea issue continue to be part of our cooperation and part of the uh, evolving architecture that we want to build. And uh, I will stop here. But I think that uh, the U.S. and Vietnam, we have a long uh, uh, process of normalization to become comprehensive partnership at this time. And we have strong foundations to further move forward uh, for the next two decades, for example. At the same time, we are not just working bilaterally, but we have a lot to share and a lot to work together uh, regionally and globally as well. Thank you very much, Seth. Yeah. So the ambassador has graciously offered to take some questions and have some discussion. And so uh, we have a mic here. We'd encourage you to come up to it. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, and you can form a line behind it so we can be as efficient in getting to as many of you as possible. Tell us your name and what you're studying. Uh, and now we have some time for you to ask some questions of the ambassador, please. Easy question first. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I'm, what do you want, want your, us to say? Your name and your major. Name and major, okay. I'm Nathaniel Sackett. I'm studying international development and political science. I am interested in uh, what you highlighted with the eradication of hunger and elimination of the problem of poverty. How has, um, have those issues been most effectively um, progressing toward um, being solved in your country. Thank you very much. Actually, poverty alleviation is very much a priority in Vietnam's strategy for national development. If you look back uh, two decades ago or t 10 years ago, you will see that Vietnam from a less developed countries. So a lot of the rate of, uh, of poverty uh, is very high, it's about 40% or something. And it, the figure is now 4.5% for the po poverty uh, ratio uh, that, that, that we have in the, in, 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 in the economy of Vietnam. And one of the things is that for uh, lesser developed countries, what we need to do is that poverty always been in the context of the economic uh, plan for the country. We often adopt a five-year economic plan for the country's development. So it's always part of that. And number two, that, that relates to the priorities that in terms of policy. But number two, you have to give funding sources to support that one as well. So funding sources will be from the following major uh, uh, source, sources. Number one, from the government, we have to allocate some uh, uh, budget to that. Number two, from foreign investors and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, financial support. Uh, for example, from uh, the United Nations, but at the same time, we have a long-term uh, program with the World Bank on poverty alleviation within the context of economic development of the country. 
We have from the NGO, foreign NGOs as well. But at the same time, mobilizing the private sector to support the poor people will be very much important. So number three, we have the policy, we have the money, but how we do it? So we have to uh, train the people, especially training the trainers will be very much important. And we have uh, people in the, what we call in Vietnam, the mass uh, organizations like the Women's Union, they are very much helpful in working together with the households because the households, the, the ladies are there, they are very much caring about the family for, for example, using the system of microcredit, for example. That is very much helpful. Uh, job creation, uh, training, education, and microcredit would be very much important for uh, the people in the rural area. But at the same time, we need to ask the big companies to not only to help, but to uh, have a responsibility as well to, to work on uh, the policy of poverty alleviation. So I think uh, this one. But reducing the rate of poverty line in Vietnam is just now not international standard, but Vietnam is standard. Sometimes in, before we have uh, 150,000 dons as a, for a household in a year, is something as poverty line, and now we raise it up. So we, I will have to check with how they consider uh, poverty, uh, uh, poor country, uh, poor poor family, at what level of income. But I have to check with the actual uh, actual figure of that. But the policy, the money, but at the same time, you need uh, a ways to help the people to sustain their daily life through education, to training, that is very much important, apart from financial support. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ashton Omdahl. I, uh, I'm a student studying bioinformatics, but my family has a special connection to Vietnam because my father was actually uh, in the Foreign Service working in the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, for the American Embassy in Hanoi. And so now that the United States has approached and kind of passed this this 20 year threshold with Vietnam um, and trade relations are really beginning to grow, where do you see um, the relations heading in the next 10 years or so as far as commerce and trade goes? I think uh, we have a very good future and prospect for mm -hmm. our trade and economic relations. Number one, because we have strong foundation for our relations now, and if you look back to the past five years, for example, every year, the trade relation, uh, volume of our two countries uh, increases uh, some 18% or something uh, year after year. So that's so already a good uh, uh, signal for, for us. Number two, as US and Vietnam strengthen our political and other relations, opportunities are offered to us, including not only in trade, but I may consider it as trade-supported cooperative activities like people-to-people -people exchange, tourism, education exchange. It also support trade mm -hmm. further uh, to our country. But number three, I, I present to you over there that Vietnam is now uh, reforming itself and restructuring the economy. So incentives are there for foreign investment. So I think American investment will be very much important. So that create trades as well. But most important thing is that we have the TPP. So the TPP will create a level playing field uh, for both countries' companies to work together. And I have very much hope that trade will be increasing. And they, they, they are telling about something that even 30% of increasing in trade volume in the next 10 years because of the TPP. So I very much hope that the TPP will be ratified both here in Washington DC and there in Hanoi. And we start working on, uh, on the possibilities and the potential and the chances for expanding further our trade relations. Thank you. This is income owed. Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Brian Britton, a business entrepreneurship major. Um, so I actually served my mission in the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission, which covered Vietnam also. And so I just had some questions um, regarding, I guess, religion, because when we first, when missionaries first got there, they couldn't wear their name tags, and they couldn't talk to people about their religion on the streets. But while I was there, there was kind of a lot more um, acceptance of the church in Vietnam while I was there, and it kind of started progressing more and more. Um, so I was wondering what, um, when you see like a, a complete acceptance of the church in Vietnam and just kind of the role of religion in the future of Vietnam as you see it. And sorry, this may be kind of a big question. <laughs> uh, so you have big question. I tried to put it in smaller <laughs> questions. <Okay. laughs> that, that's fine. That's right. <laughs> Number one, uh, if you talk about the ordinary people, you will not recognize any difference. People are talking of different uh, religions that they follow. So uh, we have uh, Buddhism in Vietnam, we have Christian in Vietnam, we have Catholics in Vietnam, and we have our own uh, Cao Dai and Hua Hao, for example, sex in Vietnam as well. So if daily people, they are not considering you as something different if you had different uh, belief and different religions. Now for the policy of the government, uh, in our constitution, in our policy, we have a respect for both uh, believers and non-believers in a way that, and we recognize also a freedom, freedom of uh, religion in our country. And uh, we have, uh, how many, I, I'm not quite sure, but, but quite a, uh, something up to nearly 100 uh, uh, religions in, in our country, including uh, some part of, of the countries we have Muslim as well, and they have uh, their churches and they have practices as well. And with regard to the uh, Latter-day Saints uh, Church, um, your representative and including uh, the Andrew, uh, Honorable uh, Holtman has been to Vietnam, and uh, we are in a part now discussing on the establishment of the representation of the church in Vietnam. And as a process uh, starts, uh, the church has set up a interior, an interim board, and I think it will be soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my trip over here, I tried to understand and to convey that to my government as well. Any final questions? You're excellent, Lindsay. Uh, my name is Ricky Geddes. I'm an international relations major here at BYU. And this summer, I was able to go and perform research in Vietnam and far exceeded any expectations I've ever had of Vietnam. It was wonderful. Um, I had a question. You, you talked earlier about bilateral relationships between Vietnam and US are relying on an expansion of human rights. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit not only on what's happened in the recent past, but what do you see happening in the, in the near future? Thank you. Actually, I talk about the comprehensive partnership statement that was adopted by President Obama and uh, my president. Uh, it includes the uh, nine pillars of our cooperation as priority areas. So uh, from political cooperation to foreign affairs, to science, technology, defense, security, and the last part was human rights one. For the human rights, we have differences, but we have similarities as well. We have been parties to a number of uh, international human rights conventions, and uh, we recognize the values and freedoms in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in uh, 1948. So all this one that we share, but at the same time, we have some differences because of our uh, different political and, and, and social system. So for that, for that one, before it seems to be a taboo, but for now, we have a good relations, and for now, we decided that we can have a very frank and constructive dialogue and cooperation and conversation on all these issues that we have differences. I think this is a nice part of our comprehensive partnership we can talk of commonalities and in increasing our relationship and cooperation, but at the same time, if we have differences, we can talk frankly in a constructive manner on this one. So we have a lot of other differences as well. For example, on trade, we have a lot of differences. 
on market assess how much we have here and how much we you have there in Vietnam. Or we have a lot of problems with uh, the high tariff level over here, including the anti-dumping taxes. So, but in in the past, there may be some group of people thinking this is a, a kind of hostile attitude to Vietnam, but nowadays we think it facts of life and we need to talk with, with each other to find ways in between to understand each other.